Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and this presentation is titled The Tragic Loss of an Astronaut Crew, Elliot C. and Charlie Bassett in 1966. And the loss of this crew changed the crew sequence for the moon landing. Now, Elliot C. and Charles Bassett were obviously experienced test pilots, had been chosen for the Gemini program, and at the time, uh, you didn't get chosen for this program unless you were an experienced test pilot. Now, the accident, which occurred in February 28, 1966, at uh, a little bit after 8 in the morning, just before 9 a.m., was attributed to pilot error. They found no mechanical uh, problems with the aircraft. Now, I, th I think this is blatantly unfair. Because the Air Force back in that time totally was inadequate in their training for circling approaches for high-speed aircraft. And when I graduated as a student pilot in the T-38, I was good at flying the T-38. I enjoyed the airplane. And we had a certain instrument capability and weather capability. But most of the time when the weather was bad, we didn't fly. And the Air Force Flight Test Center is located out in the Mojave Desert at Edwards Air Force Base in California is there for a reason. You want good weather. You don't do test flights, typically, unless you're test flying, you know, Cat 3 approach equipment, stuff like that. You want good weather. You you want smooth air and you want great visibility. Uh, if we had less than 60, to 60 miles visibility when I was out at Edwards, that was a bad day. You know, normally a front would come through, clear out the haze, and then the You'd start the process of the haze coming over the uh, mountains from L.A. there. And, oh, in a bad day, I'd get down to 40. But then a front would come through and clean it up. But this was the environment that most test pilots were used to flying in. When I got out of the Air Force and went to the airlines, that's when I fully realized what flying in crappy weather was like. And, you know, when you've got a good horizon, it's easy to fly around visually. But when you start shrinking your visibility down, that horizon goes away. You're flying around in kind of a fuzzy ball. And that is much more challenging. And not only was it something that, that test pilots typically didn't experience, but it was really poorly trained for in the Air Force, and especially when it comes to circling approaches. And I made mention about circling approaches in, in another video. Now, I really enjoyed the T-38. Uh, it was fun as a student. It was fun when I was a chase pilot out at the Air Force Flight Test Center. It's a great airplane, but you can see by looking at it, there's not much of a wing there. You had to fly this airplane fast, which is fine. It was meant to be flown fast, but it was not a difficult airplane to fly, but it was very sensitive. One degree of pitch changed the vertical velocity by 900 feet per minute. One degree of pitch. And it would roll at 720 degrees a second, and an afterburner would climb at 30,000 feet per minute. This was a moving airplane. It was fun to fly but it was fast. Now, they were coming into Lewis Lambert. They were going uh, to the uh, McDonnell Douglas Center where they were uh, putting together their uh, spacecraft for the Gemini 9 mission. And Elliot C. and Charles Bassett were the primary crew of um, Gemini 9. And they had taken off from Ellington Air Force Base in the morning, and it was a two-ship. In the uh, second ship was uh, Thomas Stafford, who was the um, center commander when I was out at Edwards, and Eugene Sherman. They were the backup crew for Gemini 9. Now, the accident report says that the required visibility uh, was 401. Now, this is the current approach plate. It lists it as 203 quarters for a Cat 1 ILS. Now, okay, 200 and a half is about as low as you go on a Cat 1 ILS. So this one's a little bit higher, but they, they said it was 401. And a circling approach, which you don't see on this approach chart, do you? Uh, a lot of these have been removed. The circling approach... Uh, the minimums for that were listed as 500 uh, feet and one and a half miles. And, okay, that, that's reasonably ridiculous. And I'll explain this in a little bit more detail. But you see, Category E, you know, if you look at most approach plates, if you're a, you know, a regular uh, civilian pilot, you don't see Category E much. Um, we're talking about high-speed aircraft. Now, I didn't realize till I was fortunate enough to be selected to go to the Air Force Instrument Flight uh, School uh, down in San, San Antonio, Texas. I did not realize um, how difficult it was to fly a circling approach in a high-speed aircraft. Now, it's kind of interesting. My instructor down there, it, it's called IPAS, my instructor down there, uh, he, he and I both became uh, 
pilots for United Airlines, and we both uh, were triple seven captains. And uh, the last time I saw him, uh, we were both on the tracks going to Hawaii. He was about a thousand feet above me in a triple seven, and we talked on the common frequency. And uh, he broke off to go to Honolulu, and I uh, continued the uh, track to go in in Maui. Yeah, it's the last time we saw each other looking uh, out the cockpit windows of the triple seven. But one thing they impressed upon me was circling approaches and how difficult they were in high-speed aircraft. Now, let's look at the categories. Um, the T-38, because of its approach speed, um, mainly, there's also a weight factor on this, but the approach speed is 166 knots. And on the, on the T-38, you would be flying, well, 175, 180 knots in the circling portion, and you would slow down. Uh, you could still be doing um, 165 or more on final. So you were definitely a Category E aircraft. But my Cessna 152, my fully IFR Cessna 152 was a Category A. Um, my 310 that I own now, that's definitely Category B. The uh, 777 in that, depending on weight, could be a Category C. Sometimes it would slip up into a D if, if the speed was high, you know, if you had to come back around heavyweight. But uh, now you're getting up in the Category D, the fighters, the 141 to 165, um, which is, is more typical. But the T-38, high-speed aircraft, it's uh, definitely a Category E aircraft. Now, when I was uh, down at IPAS, we're down tech in Texas, uh, there, San Antonio, and we uh, set up some Category E circling approaches. Now, with the turn radius, uh, you can see from these diagrams, you know, if you're 120 knots, you can be nice and tight, but you start getting 180 knots, and to make the turn, you have to be much farther out. Okay, when they flew this circling approach, uh, they had an 800-foot ceiling. It was rain, snow, it was deteriorating, and... Um, the, the visibility uh, just was not very good. It was good enough to shoot the circling approach. It was above one and a half. But when you're down at 500 feet a mile from the runway, there's some problems. And until I flew these, you know, I thought, man, I'm an, I'm an instrument pilot. I'm, you know, I got my Air Force wings. I'm an instrument pilot. I know what I'm doing. I know how to do this. But uh, yeah, a circling approach is a totally different animal. And there's a gotcha. See, there's a blue line there, the one that's pointed towards uh, the little black thing that's supposed to be the runway. Now, when you're up at a normal traffic pattern at uh, 1,500 feet, you get a certain sight picture, you know, looking down, a certain deflection angle. Well, when you're, and, that, and that's the blue line, and you make a normal uh, descending final turn around to final. When you're where the aircraft is that's, we're sitting there at, at uh, five 600 feet, you know, to get that same picture, there's there's the red depiction. Well, it looks good to you, but you start the turn, and with, of course, the same turn radius of the aircraft, um, that's not good. You're way off to the side. Now, I was senior flight examiner at uh, Standards Evaluation uh, Wing Stanovel out at Edwards Air Force Base, and I gave check rides and instruction to test pilots and astronauts, and one thing I found was that, and, and because of my experience at IPIS, I realized that this was not properly taught. And as part of a checkout or as part of a check ride, I said, oh, let's, let's go up and we go up to China Lake and let's shoot a circling approach up there and we'll go down to circling minimums and we'll do it. Well, invariably, to be in the correct position, it was a horrible sight picture. You are down low. You are far out. It looks terrible. And you start the turn and you think, oh, I'm, I'm way too far out. And you want to shallow it out. No, you got to keep the turn in. You got to keep it coming around. And invariably, the guys would be in too tight and, you know, they'd start to realize it. And, and, and by the time you really realized it, I mean, you're almost to beam the runway and it's going, oh, this is no good. And of course, uh, in the uh, you know in the the training situation, it was well you know this is training. We'll we'll go back. We'll break this off. We'll talk about it. Uh, we'll go back, and I'll kind of talk you through the circling approach, and then it made a big impression. On on the check ride, of course, people are a little more concerned, and I'd say, uh, uh, you know, not part of the check ride academic situation. Um, this is a learning experience. Uh, there, there's no jeopardy here. We're going to do one of these and we're going to talk about it. And uh, so I'm going to show you. So that, that took a lot of relief there and we'd go out and we'd fly it. And it was an eye opener. Uh, it really was uh, to see, you know, how uh, bad of a picture it looked, how low you were and coming in and turning. So um, when 
C. and Bassett got in this situation where they, they were coming down final on the ILS, and uh, for some reason they ended up high. Um, so they broke it off. They said, hey, we'll just do a circling approach. Okay, well, I'm sure they, they probably got in a little too tight, and they, um, they were coming around, and uh, the problem is, when you're low like that and you're overshooting, you tend to pull the back pressure and add power. Well, in the 38, if you start to get slow, the bottom just falls out. The sink rake picks up, and that's what happened to them. They realized it too late. They went into afterburner. They got the right one lit. The The left one was in the process of coming up, but they hit. And they they hit um, the hangar actually where their aircraft, where their spacecraft uh, was being uh, assembled in the final assembly. Uh, it was Hangar 101, I believe, there. And um, there were 17 people inside the hangar that were injured. Now, it's NASA 901. Uh, Stafford and Cernan were in uh, tail number 907 behind him. And as they're coming around on the circling approach b behind uh, 901, they, they lost sight of him, so they went missed approach. And uh, unfortunately, 901 crashed. And it was there's a little confusion with air traffic control and just who was who. And they, aff they asked uh, uh, Stafford and his aircraft to identify, you know, uh, which one was in which aircraft. But uh, uh, Tom Stafford, General Stafford, landed... Uh, and had not realized uh, that C and Bassett had crashed actually in into the building, and they ended up being killed just 500 feet from the the final assembly of their aircraft. And here's another picture of the aircraft, and the little arrow there points to where it, it impacted the uh, the building, and the people inside the building were hurt by uh, falling debris uh, from the from the collision where they uh, where the aircraft struck the top of the building there now here's a picture of the gemini 9 spacecraft being assembled in the uh, mcdonald douglas uh, hangar now in the aftermath of the crash the backup crew of tom stafford and eugene cernan were uh, moved up to the primary position for Gemini 9. And this was scheduled in early June. Uh, Jim Lovell and Buzz Aldrin, who were formerly had been the backup crew for Gemini 10, became the mission backup crew and through the normal rotation were assigned as primary crew for Gemini 12. Without the Gemini experience, it is unlikely that Aldrin would have been assigned Apollo 11. So because of the sequence of events, Aldrin became the second man to land on the moon. And without the Gemini experience, that would not have happened for him. Anyway, that's the story and what I think is an unfair characterization and blaming the crew for pilot error. I think it's a lack of adequate pilot training in a type of accident that has been plaguing the, um, uh, the Air Force and probably other services for quite some time. And I'm... This is, uh, I'm kind of new at this. I'm going to put a uh, link here to my uh, discussion about circling approaches and how um, they've been uh, causing accidents in the T-38 for a very long time. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.